Hello and welcome to Source Dive, where we take an in-depth look at some of the interesting low-level open source projects out there. Okay, so to really kick this off, this series, um, we're going to start off with something called XV6. XV6 is a Unix-based operating system that is kind of used for teaching, right? It's the basis of a whole bunch of operating systems undergraduate courses. And uh, yeah, like I just want to highlight here the, the GitHub page. It's, uh, it's under MIT PDOS, and this is the XV6 RISC V. So we're going to be looking at the RISC V variant. There are various variants of the XV6 operating system. We're going to be taking a look at RISC V. Um, okay, so XV6 is a re-implementation of Dennis Ritchie's and Ken Thompson's Unix version 6, which was just V6. XV6 loosely follows the structure and style of V6, but is implemented for a modern RISC-V multiprocessor using ANSI-C. Okay, so there's, there's a bit going on there. This is uh, a re-implementation of the original Unix, or the version 6 of Unix. So once it had matured a little bit and gotten through some of its um, initial periods of building abstractions, this is based on the actual code by Dennis Ritchie and ten, uh, Ken Thompson. So you know it's actually going to be pretty good, as they were fairly good programmers as, uh, as, as things go. And... Uh, this is actually implemented for RISC-V, so there's going to be a bunch of RISC-V specific things in there, although, of course, this is an operating system, so at some level, you know, there's a bunch of code which is agnostic, and there'll be some code which is processor-specific or architecture-specific. Uh, it's multi-processor. That means that this is a multi-core system. Um, we are actually going to be running with something that more than one CPU, and because of that, there's going to be a whole bunch of things inside the operating system that have to be aware of that. So that's, I think, quite interesting if you haven't uh, played around with kind of, uh, yeah, the idea of having multiple cores at the same time is quite an interesting one. And ANSI C. So this is implemented using very standard, you know, very kind of, I don't know, how, not modern C, uh, what we would call modern C, but ANSI C, so sort of like the very broad variant that is is well known by almost everyone. Uh, so that's what we're going to be doing. And kind of the point of this series in general uh, is, is basically to really get good at programming, you have to write a lot of code, but you also have to read a lot of code. And I think that is uh, one of the points where people fall down a little bit, especially beginners and intermediate programmers, I think don't realize the importance of reading code versus writing it. Um, and I think it's kind of obvious why that's a good thing, right? It forces you to, you know, like learn about new ideas that you haven't come across before, but also just different ways of structuring different ways of solving problems that you might not have thought of yourself if you spent five years just writing things. Because sometimes we get stuck in our own little, uh, you know, ruts, our own ways of doing things. And kind of stepping out of the box, reading other people's solutions is a really good way of getting around that. And in my opinion, it's a really good way to level up. So that's what I like to do myself. That's what we're going to do in this series. And I've been studying this code base for the last couple of weeks, the XV6 RISC-V code base. And I have to say it's really beautiful. I, I really like it. And it's the first time I've really come face to face with any operating system code. The first time that I've really dived into this kind of stuff. The first time I've really looked at multi-processor uh, kind of systems at this low level. So yeah, this is quite an, an interesting one. And I just wanna share kind of what my process is of kind of approaching an unfamiliar code base, how you can kind of find your way around. And uh, yeah, and let's explore this code. So without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, the first thing you're gonna wanna do is to actually clone the code, right? So you wanna come over here, you wanna click the, the code button and you wanna download this so that you can open it in your own editor. You don't wanna be trying to explore code on GitHub itself. Now. Yes, GitHub has improved in the last couple of years. Yes, you 
you can get a lot of information through their standard interface. They also have kind of an online code, uh, code sandbox interface. That's also great. Still, I would say download this, open it up in your own editor with your own editor settings, your own key bindings, all of the familiarities that you have there, because that's going to give you the best chance at kind of really getting to grips with the code. You, you arm yourself with the tools that you use every day to actually understand code that you and your colleagues write. Uh, apply that same thing when you're reading code to learn, right? That's It's the same idea. Treat it like any other code base. So let's switch over to the, the code view. And so we're here in, uh, in VS Code. I've downloaded the project and um, it looks like there are a few files changed. It's really only me um, removing empty white space from the end of lines because that drives me crazy. It comes up as a red, uh, like a red thing on the end of the line on this editor. So I like to fix those, but the code is just uh, as it is now. Uh, I haven't really changed anything. Um, so we have a couple of directories inside the project. We have the kernel. There's a whole bunch of stuff here. There's no kind of folder structures. We've got a whole bunch of header files, C files, assembly files. And it's kind of overwhelming, I think. If you come into a project, this is a, actually a relatively small project. Um, and if you come into this and you, you see this number of files, it's kind of hard to even figure out where to begin. <clears throat> uh, so we're gonna look at well, my techniques for doing that. There's another uh, little directory here called MKFS, make file system. There's a single C file in there. That's really about building up the file system for this operating system. So it, uh, there is a file system that gets created and kind of we can pass that to the environment that we, we end up kind of creating to run this operating system. We'll look at how we build and run the operating system in a moment. Finally, there is a directory of user programs. So these are the user mode programs. This is kind of like the system software that you expect, right? Uh, things like mkdir, make directory, and things like printf, and the shell, and uh, malloc, the user malloc, so memory allocation. So this is basically a whole bunch of, um, yeah, utilities that you can expect to run on your operating system. Uh, all right, so that's kind of how it is. Let's actually build the project and take a quick look at, um, just a quick look at running it and get an idea of what we're even dealing with here. So uh, to build this, um, <clears throat> you need a RISC-V toolchain and uh, getting RISC-V toolchain set up is not always trivial. Um, it's, it can actually be a little bit of a pain. And for that reason, I have packaged up a, a RISC-V toolchain, a very general RISC-V toolchain that can uh, do all the various, um, all the various uh, flavors of RISC-V, 64-bit, 32-bit, the various uh, extensions that you can have. I've packaged those up into a Docker, um, <clears throat> a Docker uh, image. <clears throat> and I'll leave a link to that image where you can download it in the description of this video so that you can use my own uh, Docker toolchain for this. So what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna run uh, make inside Docker. So what that's gonna do is open this whole project up in Docker that has a RISC-V toolchain and build the project. It seems a bit crazy overkill to do this. I do understand that, but it's a good way of making sure it's reproducible. So we're gonna run the build. This is the real-time build. The kernel has been built all of the user system software has been built. Uh, it all gets linked together and then everything is kind of ready. So if we open up the kernel directory now, you'll see that there are all these extra files in there. So there's like a .d file, there's a .o file. There is a uh, kernel.sim, which is all of the uh, kernel symbols that we can use uh, uh, that, that got assembled. And there is a kernel.asm, which is kind of a an assembly dump uh, mixed in with the C code <clears throat> of the whole operating system. So this is kind of quite a useful thing to do when you're when you're debugging. If you this is a good debug strategy to, to take advantage of. All right, let's actually run this. So in order to run this, um, we need to run this in QEMU, the QEMU emulator. So it's basically a uh, a way of running kind of virtual machines, emulated machines. Um, and you can do it with all different kinds of architectures. 
And yeah, basically this project is, is kind of targeting a virtual QEMU um, machine. But that machine has kind of virtualized hardware for things like disks and all, all the kind of various like supporting hardware that you'd have around the CPU, like an interrupt controller and all of that kind of stuff. All of that is actually built into the emulator. So to actually port this over to real hardware is, uh, is quite possible, it's quite doable. You would have to do some work, but not too much. Like uh, it's, it's, it's not too far off what a real computer would be. So in order to uh, do this, we're gonna run make QEMU. We don't do this one inside Docker because QEMU, I just have it installed on my system. Um, you can quite easily install QEMU on the system. It's kind of out of scope to go into how to do that now. Um, but I'm gonna run that and it looks like we're missing the file system image. So we need to build that. So I'm gonna do again, uh, running inside the Docker container to make the file system image. It goes ahead, it's gonna do that. And we should be able to run make QEMU now. And what we can see here is, and maybe I'll just uh, clear the screen first uh, before we do this. Okay, so <clears throat> we run this command, uh, QEMU system uh, RISC-564, a virtual machine, no BIOS, kernel. This is the build kernel that we have that, that gets built from this directory. Uh, this is the amount of memory that we have, RAM memory, 128 megabytes. Uh, SMP, symmetric multiprocessor, um, three. I think that stands for symmetric multiprocessor. We have three CPUs in this. We can run up to eight by default in, uh, in um, uh, XV6. No graphical, and we're emulating a disk drive. So that's what that last part all goes into. All right, so what we can see is we get a message that says the XV6 kernel is booting. We see another message that says heart one starting, heart two starting. Then we see that init is starting the shell. And you can see that we have a shell prompt here. And if I run the ls command, you can see we kind of get a kind of Unixy, Linuxy uh, output here for ls. So there's a readme and you can see that they're basically in here are all the programs that get run. So there is an echo, there is a, a cat, there is a grep, an init, a kill, symbolic link list, uh, remove, start another shell, stress test, user test, grind, word count and zombie. So we could do something like run word count on the readme file. It tells us that there are, what is that? Uh, 2,305 characters in the whole thing. Should we cat the readme file out here? So this is actually just the readme file that is in the Git repository itself. I think it's just this readme file. Um, so we can see it prints that out. And uh, what else do we have here? Let's just run one more command. Um, we can take a look at stress FS or, I haven't really run a lot of these commands, I have to admit. Uh, maybe we can try grep. So let's try cat readme and then we'll run grep. And let's try, well, I can see there's a line there with you. So let's try that. You will need risk five new lib chain from. All right, great. So that's how it works. And I'm gonna run control A X to get out of the, the machine, to kill the machine. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. It is like a little virtual computer and we can actually run multiple processes at the same time uh, on this computer as well. Um, so without further ado, let's actually look at some of the code because uh, that's kind of what this series is about. It's not so much about kind of exploring the project itself in, in like a very practical sense. Let's actually look at the code. So where do we even start with this? I'm gonna run make clean to get rid of all the built files. Where do we start with this? Well, there's a whole bunch of files in here. One of them is a linker script. And for a really low level project like this, if you have a linker script, it's actually a pretty good place to start because it's gonna tell you like what the entry point is. So if we open this up, if you're not familiar with linker script, I don't blame you. It's it's kind of one of those obscure obscure things that like people don't usually spend a whole lot of time on. Um, because I've worked quite a lot in embedded uh, uh, recently, um, 
I'm quite familiar with linker scripts, so I've, I've done a lot of work with linker scripts. So I know that, for instance, this we will specify here what the entry point of the program is. So apparently there is somewhere a function or a symbol called entry and uh, underscore entry, and that's going to be where the program starts. So that's a really good place for us to kind of begin exploration. And then there is a little bit more going on here, standard linker script stuff. This is actually a really clean, basic, straightforward linker script uh, compared to what I've seen. Uh, so this basically tells us ensure that the entry.s slash underscore entry symbol is at hex 8 million, where qemu's uh, kernel is jumping to. So this QM, qemu um, virtual machine expects the kernel to be loaded at this address. So that's kind of built into uh, this whole assumption here. And maybe that will come up in various places. Of course, we actually do need to know where various things are in the, uh, in the, uh, in the address space. So there are kind of virtual hardware that gets mapped into the address space. Uh, but we know that this is where the kernel is going to be. So that's where it's going to be ending up when we build it. All right, so that means that we can go over to this entry.s file, and this is where it actually starts running. <clears throat> so this is kind of our beginning entry point. This is where everything goes. So in, in an operating system, really in any kind of project, um, in an embedded project or, or whatever, arguably the first thing you wanna do is to get out of assembly as quick as possible. Like, especially for an operating system, um, and, and also embedded projects themselves, you basically have to start in assembly. There's no, like you can't like immediately go into C because there are things you have to do to set the environ, environment up so that C can even run. You need to have something like a stack in order to make function calls and push variables onto the stack. So that's the very first thing we end up doing here. So what we do, if you're not familiar with assembly and especially not RISC-V assembly, what we're doing is we're saying that this stuff here is gonna go into the text section. The text section in terms of assembly and building uh, building code and running compilers, the text section's where the code goes. So that's, I don't know why it's called the text section, but that is what it is. Then we're declaring here a global uh, a global symbol called entry. So the symbol is available to, to everything around in the program. And here we are, we've got entry. And we've got a little comment here. This comment says, set up a stack for C. So we want, we want something where we can make function calls and not lose our state as we kind of do various function calls. The stack zero is declared in start.c. Okay, so that also gives us a little pointer to where where we need to look at next. So we can actually open up that file already. We won't do something with it yet, but I'll just leave it open there. Um, so with a 4,900, a 4,096 byte stack per CPU. So that's 4K, four kilobytes of stack space per CPU. And we can actually work out what that stack pointer needs to be based on the address of this stack zero variable, which we'll take a look at in a second multiplied by something called the heart ID, multiplied by 4096, which is the size of that stack. So let's just take a quick look at stack zero. If we open up start.c and we sort of scroll around, you'll notice this line here, and also a comment that mentions entry.s above. This is basically us just assigning some memory to be the, the stack space that we're, we're talking about here. So. The way that compiling programs works, um, if you're not too familiar with it, the way that compiling programs works is you kind of compile all the individual units separately. So this entry.s, that's gonna be compiled on its own. And this start.c is also gonna be compiled on its own. Um, and what will happen is there may be references to other places in the program that aren't actually part of your, your little module that you have. So this stack, stack zero, it doesn't actually exist here in this file, but it does exist somewhere. And that's what we're saying, like it should exist. And then there's a second step. Once you've built all of your, um, all of your objects, once you've built them all, then you come in, come in and link them all together into your final program. And that is the step where kind of you resolve this this, this 
idea of like, hey, I actually mentioned the idea of this symbol. Is it anywhere? Is it in any of these units you've given me? Oh, it is. It's over there. Great. And then we can sort of link those two things together. So that's what's happening here. We've got some memory space devoted to stack zero. And all this is actually is a character array. So it's an array of um, bytes, essentially just bytes. And how many bytes are there? There are 4096 times the number of CPUs. And this NCPU, that is a, a just a constant macro that is the maximum number of CPUs. And apparently that number is eight in XV6. So if we just kind of go to the definition of that, we open up this file called param.h. So we're kind of spidering our way out through the code base by doing this, just exploring and seeing like kind of what is this, what is this piece referring to? This is why you want to do this in your editor, by the way, because your editor has the ability to kind of resolve these symbols and, and you can use the facilities of the editor to say, this thing is mentioned, like, where is it? Tell me where it is. So the number of CPUs is, is eight, but you can see that there's a whole bunch of things in here uh, which are described like the number of processes which can run on the machine, uh, the number of open files per process, which is possible, that's apparently 16. The number of open files that can be in the whole system, that's 100. So this file param.h is kind of a parameterization of the system. You can come in here and fiddle with these values uh, to, to get to something that, that you know makes sense for whatever you're trying to accomplish. But the what as we'll see as we go along is that these numbers, um, if you change them, you can't just say, oh, well, let's make a really massive pro let's let's say that we can have a thousand processes like there is a cost associated with that, because actually for every process in the system, we pre allocate memory for it. So there is there is always uh, memory dedicated for 64 processes on this system. Whether or not we run one process or 64, there is a full 64, uh, uh, 64 process worth of space. And we can see that here in the stack sizes for the CPUs. Even though when we ran QEMU, we only ran with three CPUs, there is space for eight. So that's something to consider uh, as you're kind of fiddling with the numbers. But in the end, we end up uh, multiplying, uh, give, well, basically having 4,096 bytes per CPU in one big flat array here. And that's what we're referring to inside this comment. So let's kind of unpack ourselves a bit. What are we actually doing here? Um, this, uh, this instruction is load an address into the stack pointer. So RISC-V has a bunch of registers, uh, general purpose registers. And uh, there are 32 general purpose registers. One of them is hardwired to the value zero. So if you refer to it, you will always get the value zero back. And if you write to it, nothing will happen because it's always going to have the value zero. That turns out to be really useful. Um, uh, but yeah, this, this instruction that we're doing now, we're loading the address of this symbol stack zero into the stack pointer. So that's kind of our starting starting basis for this, even though we eventually need to get to this whole uh, equation, right? That it's stack zero plus the heart ID, whatever that may be, times 4096. Okay, so the next thing we do is we load an immediate value into the A0 register. It's just another one of the registers. Uh, and what we're loading into that is 4096, right? 1024 times four. I'm not quite sure why they didn't just put this constant in here, but in either way, it's fine, right? Uh, we know this value. Um, so A0 now contains 4K, uh, this, and SP contains stack zero. So we're kind of, we just need to do this heart ID multiplied by this uh, A0 now. In order to do that, we run this next instruction, which is CSR read. And a CSR is a, excuse me, a control and status register. Um, and a control and status register in RISC-V is a system specific uh, specialized register that isn't a general purpose register. You can't use it like you would use here, the stack pointer in every instruction. You can only use these CSR values in CSR instructions. So what we're doing is we're reading uh, into the A1 register, the special CSR M heart ID. 
And what is a hard ID? Well, a hard ID is the hardware thread ID. And that's basically a core, right? It's the index of the core that we're running on. Remember, this is a multi-core system. We can have up to eight cores. So basically, this is going to give us the unique ID of this core. And because of the way that, um, well, especially in this implementation, but generally as, as, as it works uh, uh, for um, systems that build uh, multi-core systems, like if you have a chip that implements multiple cores, they will generally, uh, they will be sequential, right? So it will go from zero, one, two, three, four onwards, maybe starting at one, maybe starting at zero. So this is going to read us the uh, the M the heart ID of this system, right? The the core ID. So let's imagine it's zero, for instance. This is the first core. So what then? What we do is we add one to that, right? That's in A one. Then we're doing an add immediate uh, result goes into A one, and it's A one plus one. So we're adding one to that. We'll get into why we add one in a second, but then we um, end up multiplying. A0, which contains this 4K, and we multiply that by um, this value that we just placed in uh, in here, which is the heart ID plus one, and then we place that back into A0. And then in the end, we add to the stack pointer and place it back into the stack pointer, uh, this A0 value. So effectively, what we've done is we've, we've, we've completed this operation now, right? The stack pointer now contains the, the beginning of the stack plus the heart ID multiplied by 4K. It's actually the heart ID, whoop, it's actually the heart ID, well, apparently it doesn't work here, plus one uh, multiplied by 4K. And the reason it's plus one is because a stack uh, in memory, it actually grows downwards. So what you wanna do is you wanna say that your stack begins at the high point and you're going to grow it uh, towards uh, sort of the beginning address as you go down. So by saying that we are um, starting at stack zero, right? And if we core zero, that's stack zero uh, times 4K, so plus uh, the, the heart ID times 4K. So that's just, that at that point, that is just stack zero. Then we're adding another 4K to that whole thing. So we're starting at the top and, that, and then we have a stack that can grow downwards for the core. I hope that makes some sense. And then finally, now that we have a stack set up, we can actually jump into C land. We can move our computation into C where our expressiveness goes up a lot, right? We, we can start to express programs a lot more uh, straightforwardly. So then we call this function start. And after that, you can see that there is just this little, um, uh, little infinite loop down here where we have a label called spin and we just jump to the spin label. So we'll just re stay on this instruction forever if we ever end up here. And we don't actually expect to ever end up here, right? This is just a kind of safety net because this function should never return. We should never end up back kind of returning from this function, the start function. If we happen to return, then we'll just spin forever. So that's kind of just a safety mechanism there. Okay, so now we can move on uh, to start.c. And uh, this is kind of gonna be the last thing that we cover in this video. I think it makes sense to, uh, to, to pick up a little bit more of the system in the next one. But basically in start.c, what we're actually doing is setting up uh, the environment ready to get the system up and running, right? Ready to actually begin running the uh, operating system. So we're, we're still kind of very low level and very processor specific while we're in start.c, but we've kind of, you know, we've, we've bumped our abstraction level up a little bit. So what are we doing in here, right? Well, as we've seen, we have this, uh, this variable for the stack. We're actually using that now as our stack space. Another thing to keep in mind is that this code and the code that we just saw in entry.s is running for every CPU, right? So if we have eight cores, all eight cores are running the same code at the same time. And kind of the way that you can differentiate those cores is the fact that we can access the core ID that we're on. So we actually can make it do different things based on the core ID. Uh, 
but right now they're all running the same code except for the fact that they all have their own individual stack. So they can all make their own individual calls, they can all have their own individual variables. So we also below here, we have a uh, some kind of timer uh, data structure going on. It's called timer on the score scratch. And for, we have an array for every CPU, we have five UN64s. So this is a two dimensional array that has the, the core index here and sort of five values that we can store. We'll get to those a little bit later. What we actually wanna focus on is this this start function, this void start. So entry.s jumps here in machine mode on stack zero. Okay, so this is where we're gonna start executing code. So something to note is in RISC-V and indeed all um, complex processors that are able to run modern operating systems, um, you have the idea of different privilege levels. Um, so the core can be running at an extremely high privilege level, say machine mode, as it's called in RISC-V. And in machine mode, you can just do everything. You can access all of the resources. You can access every possible uh, uh, register that's available, every CSR, the control, control and status registers. You have access to the entire system. But in fact, you don't want to run your kind of even your operating system code at that highest level of privilege because it's just sort of unnecessarily um, dangerous and exposing your, your system to like corruption, not even through kind of security concerns, but just through faulty software running. Um, and as another note, um, often these days, modern operating systems don't actually run on like like the highest level of, of of the system because they're often virtualized and they're not even real operating systems. So they're running inside another operating system. So they kind of, you need to be in such a place that um, your, your software runs at a level where it doesn't have to believe it owns the entire machine. So that's kind of like a, yeah, a useful thing to know. So in RISC-V, we have the machine mode, um, the machine mode uh, level of privilege. The next level down from that is called supervisor mode. And in supervisor mode, that is where you would run an operating system. So that is a, still a very high level of privilege in the system. You can do a lot. You can set up all kinds of different things. You can have interrupts, you can have exceptions. Uh, so all kinds of traps. You can deal with timers. You can deal with uh, setting up memory privileges in some cases. Uh, and you can also set up virtual memory. So that means that you can do uh, memory mapping, uh, sorry, virtual memory mapping is in like an instruction fetch happens and it goes to go from address one, two, three, but address one, two, three is actually mapped to some other physical address on the system. And the reason that we do that, of course, is so that multiple user processes can all think that they have a, a unique view of the system but they're all kind of in a self-contained box that is actually, you know, only some tiny constrained version of the actual system. And of course, that means that one process can't accidentally write to another process's memory because they're like physically not mapped to each other, right? There is no access from this place to this place. So that's kind of what virtual memory is all about. Um, and the supervisor mode, it can do all of those things. So it's able to control all of the virtual memory. And finally, below supervisor mode, there is something called user mode, right? And that is where you actually run processes and user processes. That's what we would expect kind of normal code to run on. Um, and that is the lowest level of privilege. We can't do all the normal, like we can't do all the very low level things in the system, like, you know, taking interrupts and, uh, and uh, like writing to arbitrary memory locations, changing the way that virtual memory works we're very constrained. We can only run in a small environment. And if we want to go outside of that environment, we want to do something more complicated, like talk to a piece of hardware, then we have to actually make a request to the next level up in the system, uh, the supervisor mode. We need to make a system call into the, into the supervisor and ask it to do something for us, like open a file. 
and then the, the system will go and take care of that, the operating system, and it will give back some result to the, the user's process. Okay, so what is this start function actually doing then? Well, the idea of the start function is to get us out of this highest level of machine privilege and into the supervisor level of privilege. But before we can actually do that, we need to set up a few, um, a few things in the machine mode, things that we can only do while we're at this highest level of the system. So this is a little bit RISC-V specific, this part. This is still very, it is especially RISC-V specific in that we're writing to you know, risk five related registers, but it's also um, relatively general in that you would probably need to do these same kinds of things on any other type of system, uh, but they just wouldn't manifest in the same way, right? There would be different like specific steps you'd have to do. So what are we doing? The first thing we're gonna do is to write into the, the M status register, the machine status register, and we're gonna set the bit that says the place where we just came from, the previous privilege level that we came from, which we didn't come from anywhere, we've just started the system, but bear with me for a second. Uh, the place where we just came from is gonna be supervisor mode. We're gonna manually set that. And that's what these lines are doing here. First, we just read the current machine status register, and I'll show how that works in a second. Then we are clearing the bits that represent the machine privilege, uh, previous privilege. And then we are setting those cleared bits to be the supervisor level of privilege. So that's kind of what all of these specific things are doing on these lines. And I'm not gonna go into like how these bit operations work because this is uh, bit operations that are taking place here. I've talked about that a whole bunch before in videos. And there are a whole bunch of good resources for that as well. Um, Finally, we write that back to the status register. So all we've done here is to go in and set up that the previous privilege level where we came from is supervisor mode. Um, because our end goal is gonna be to kind of trick the system into taking us back to a different place. But of course, we never really came from anywhere. We're just kind of, we're setting it all up as if we, as if we were coming from that place. So next up is uh, setting up another register called the MEPC, the Machine Exception Program Counter. This is like uh, where we have the, uh, the MPP, the Machine Previous Privilege. This is kind of like the previous place we were executing, the physical address where we were executing. So we're just setting that to be a function called main. Um, and main here, we've got like a declaration that there is some function called main somewhere. Um, but if we kind of right click and open this up, we'll actually come into this main.c file. And this is like the actual beginning of the operating system. You can even see here this message with a printf, xv6 kernel is booting. Well, we saw that earlier when we ran the operating system. So this is kind of like the actual setting up of the operating system. So the end goal is that we get to this point, but still in start.c, we have a little bit more work that we need to do. Let's actually take a look at some of these uh, functions here. Like, so this R, M, R underscore M status, well, that stands for read the M status register. So let's take a look at that. That brings us to this file called risk5.h. And risk5.h just contains a whole bunch of um, inline functions, which are basically, uh, as you can see, just uh, assembly instructions. So there's just like a single assembly instruction that's happening inside this this function. So it's not even a real function actually, like this is gonna become inlined and it's gonna become inlined in such a way that it translates to basically a single instruction. So um, this is quite interesting, like this is something that we need to do is kind of a bridge between C and and the assembly world. We we sometimes still need to do these really specific C uh, uh, like processor specific things, but we want to do them from the world of C, right? We don't want to still do all of this stuff in assembly. We could, but it's it's still nicer to do all of this in C. So, um, what all of these instructions do, like for instance, read the M status register. Well, it basically executes a CSR read. Uh, of the M status register, 
and it ends up putting it into this kind of generic register that happens. This is special syntax for C, for doing inline assembly. And there are ways that we can basically say, hey, run this instruction and kind of get it to like treat this register, which we haven't specified, get it to treat it as this variable. Um, so we have a variable in C, but we can kind of cross it over with the assembly and say, well, when you read this value, kind of stick it into this variable, and then we return that variable in the end. So this is the way in which we can like cross, cross the bridge, right, between assembly and C. And likewise, we have the, the equivalent write M status that takes in an X. And what we end up doing is a CSR write of the M status register with this generic thing. And of course, that generic thing that we're trying to do is this X value. So we're, we're in this case, injecting the value instead of extracting it out. And all of those work the same, right? So the uh, write underscore MEPC, uh, that does exactly the same thing. This is our X. We end up injecting that kind of into an assembly uh, instruction. And next, after that, after we've kind of set up uh, these two pieces, which are just saying that eventually when we drop down, we want to drop back down into the supervisor mode. Um, this next part is kind of doing a little bit of setup on the supervisor mode. So we're going to disable paging. Paging is to do with virtual memory. And this register here, the SATP or the supervisor address translation something i don't remember what the p stands for but it's to do with address translation um we're writing a zero into that and basically what that does it turns off virtual memory so when we um, end up in the supervisor we're still like every address that we talk about in the system is still a regular old physical address like if i say one two three it means one two three in the system uh, I think by default in almost every implementation, virtual memory would be off by default, but this is kind of just like a, let's make sure it's off uh, kind of thing. Okay, next up, if you read the comments, it also explains a lot of what we're doing here. We're gonna delegate all of the interrupts and the exceptions to supervisor mode. So interrupts and exceptions, they're like a very core low level thing that happens in operating systems and happens in, uh, you know, on processes in general. Interrupts are things like, oh, a certain amount of time went by, so I, the, the CPU gets interrupted from what it's doing right now, and it goes and runs some other code somewhere. And an exception, of course, is like, if I try to do something that doesn't make sense on the system, then maybe an exception will take place. Collectively, interrupts and exceptions are called traps. Um, so the, the idea of what we're doing here is we are setting up so that all the traps that can happen on the system, they're going to end up in supervisor mode. Because by default, if a trap happens on the system, it goes up to the highest level of privilege on the system to be handled. And that's by design, right? If you are running a system and you want to actually virtualize multiple operating systems on that and you get an interrupt or an exception, you kind of want to kick that up to the highest level, like the actual software that's running and controlling these multiple operating systems. And that can decide how it's going to like kind of deal with that situation. Maybe it passes that on to one of the operating systems. Maybe it does something else. But um, what we actually want to do is say that no, all of this stuff is going to go to the supervisor mode. We don't really want anything to happen in machine mode. So we are writing a register called the ME Delech. So that's the, the delegation register for machine mode exceptions. Machine mode exception delegation register. And we're writing FFFF in there. And that is a 16 bit all one. Like every single bit in the 16 bit number is a one. and the way that this works is that there are 16 bits and those 16 bits each individually refer to one of the exceptions or the interrupts that can happen. And we're just basically saying, no, all of them, all exceptions should be delegated. Likewise, all machine interrupts should be delegated. And finally, we do this right here to the SIE register, and that is the supervisor interrupt enable register. And inside that 
register, we can set a bit for all of the possible types of interrupts and exceptions that might take place and the ones that we want to deal with. And the ones that we want to deal with are basically all of them. So it is the, uh, the supervisor exceptions that happen, the supervisor timer interrupts and the supervisor software interrupts. Um, sorry, this is not exception, this is external interrupts. So this is like something coming from the outside world, like for instance, a hard drive telling you that it has some data ready. So we are writing into this register saying that um, the supervisor mode is ready and willing to handle these types of um, interrupts and exceptions. So this is kind of a requirement of the way that RISC-V works with this delegation. Um, in order for a exception or a trap to be delegated, it both has to have a bit set in these registers and it has to have the corresponding bit set in the supervisor register. So that's kind of what's going on here. Next up, we do some physical memory protection configuration. Um, this is something you can do in RISC-V. It's actually pretty interesting. You can, you can configure in a very fine-grained way what different regions of memory, uh, how they can be accessed and what kind of privileges they have. And in this case, all we're doing is allowing the supervisor mode to have full access to all of memory. So we're, we're not trying to set up fine-grained permissions. We're just saying, no, supervisor mode can do everything. So that's what these two uh, instructions are doing here. Uh, as you can see, the next part is asking for clock interrupts. So we'll go into that in a second um, and we'll look at that in more detail. But the, the final thing we're going to do is to read the heart ID. Now we already saw how to do that in actual assembly. This is the same. And this gives us the, the hardware thread ID. So we store it in this variable and then we write it to the thread pointer. And the thread pointer is actually a general purpose register in the system. Um, it's just one of the 32 possible registers in RISC-V. And um, the reason that we do this is because the, uh, the, the hardware ID, sorry, the hardware thread ID is actually um, a machine mode register. That means that once you're in supervisor mode, we couldn't run like this function anymore because we don't have access to it, right? We're not allowed to view that in supervisor mode. And that kind of makes sense if you think about it because supervisor mode, it's not supposed to be fully aware of the hardware, the situation that it's in. So the reason that we do this is and store it in this register is so that supervisor mode always knows which core is running, like which core is this code running on, uh, because it's going to be inside this register called the thread pointer. And we never uh, overwrite the value in the thread pointer, right? While we're running in the kernel, the thread pointer register will always contain the hardware ID. So that's kind of how that works. It's pretty cool. We'll see that that gets used throughout the system in a whole bunch of places. The last thing that happens is just a final inline uh, assembly instruction, mret, that is machine mode return. And machine mode return is a way to return from one privilege level <clears throat> into another privilege level. And of course, the way that it does that is it goes and looks at these two things, the previ previous privilege uh, bits that are set up here and the MEPC the machine program, uh, machine exception program counter. So what it will do when we get an MRET instruction is provided that we are actually in machine mode, we will look at those two things and we will set the code to be running at that address. So we're gonna be running at main and we're going to uh, set the privilege level to whatever is specified inside the privilege uh, bits of this M status register. So as soon as this instruction runs, we end up in this function and we're then running in supervisor mode. So that is kind of everything we need to do to get set up to actually be in um, uh, supervisor mode, ready to kick the system off. Now there's one thing that we didn't talk about here, which is the timer interrupts. Um, that's this little function that gets set up down here. We'll talk about that in the next video, I think. Um, this has kind of gone on for long enough and it's quite a dense amount of information. But this is pretty cool, right? Uh, this is some of the 
is some of the trickiest part of the the system in a way because it's it's part that isn't really related to the operating system in general. This is really just bootstrapping to get to the point that we can start running the operating system. And every single piece of operating system code in the world, including Linux and Windows and anything else, will have some level of like this bootstrapping code that has to happen at the beginning, which is really just kind of getting everything to the point where we can even run. Uh, okay. So let's call it uh, an end here. Um, I'm really interested to know what you think of these kinds of videos, this format of video. Um, so please leave me a comment and let me know. Let me know if something wasn't clear or if you'd like uh, to, to highlight something else. Uh, I'm really curious. Um, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.